Hi everyone, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, so I'll be discussing my use of Transcribus in my re PhD research, which is looking at legacies of race and slavery in the Encyclopedia Britannica, um, the first eight editions using a text mining approach. So first published in 1768, the Encyclopedia Britannica was published in Edinburgh, Scotland, and its approach to science, reason, and the organization of knowledge was a real exemplification of <coughs> the Scottish Enlightenment and the wider Enlightenment movement. It was a reference publication with its first page claiming here, it as a dictionary of arts and science compiled upon a new plan. As well as entries in alphabetical order, as you would see in a, in a modern day dictionary, um, this new plan included longer essays to unify concepts um, that were in disparate parts across the Encyclopedia Britannica in the hopes that this would improve knowledge on certain topics such as shipbuilding, anatomy, and other various topics that require quite a lot of information. It was published at a time where anti-slavery sentiment was increasing in Britain, whilst the Atlantic slave trade was, um, was continuing, and that's what I'll be focusing on in my research. So my research is looking at the first eight editions, which go from 1768 to 1860, and this presents the opportunity to research um, lots of different stages in the movement towards abolition, so the continuation of the slave trade um, up to abolition and how attitudes changed after that. There's a huge amount of text to work with and I'll give you a breakdown of exactly what's involved later on. Um, but each edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica ranges from three editions in the first edition, uh, three volumes in the first edition, up to 20 volumes in the final ones that I'm looking at in this period. So there is a huge amount of data to look at. The data that I'm using is from the National Library of Scotland's Data Foundry, which houses select digitized collections as data sets from the library collections um, as open access data collections um, that can be reused. The Encyclopedia Britannica data set is very comprehensive and it's a really valuable resource um, and I'm using some of the images that are included here. It has XML files, met metadata, excuse me, METS metadata files at item level and 155,000 images included. It also has OCR that has been generated from the in-house digitization um, process, um, which, as you can imagine, contains a lot of errors. It was produced using industry standard tools, but that has brought me onto my research with Transcribus. Having good quality Machine processable data is crucial in text mining and the OCR just didn't quite cut it. Just to give you an idea of what I was looking at originally with the OCR and then how we can move from this with Transcribus, there were numerous errors including misrecognition of the long S. So as someone looking at race and slavery, um, this was quite a big issue. OCR scripts can be written in code to fix these kind of errors, but it was including this and a lot of other errors, um, it was going to prove too much for my research. Here are some examples of the different issues. In green boxes, we have correct recognitions in the original OCR, which can be found with a QR code here. Um, there was also misrecognition of slaves and have, um, which is not particularly helpful when you're trying to find certain words in text. Due to this, I decided to move on and use Transcribus to hopefully create a text with a lower character error rate. Here are a few of the errors that appeared in the text. Um, as you can see, it's quite difficult, so I was hoping that moving into Transcribus, I would be able to create um, a more usable data set. So I trained my own Transcribus model, um, and I hand transcribed 27 pages of text from the first volume of the first edition, so 1768. Um, which totals 17,898 words and 2,368 lines of text. As you can see here, this model turned a returned a character error rate of 0.95% on the train set and 2.41% on the validation set, which I thought was quite a good result, personally, for a first attempt, so I was quite happy with the initial results. I will also note that I used the um, preset model for the layout analysis tool um, because it was my first foray to Transcribus, so I thought that was the safest way to go into it. After training, I decided to try out my model and see what the results were and if I could actually find some of the words that I might potentially be wanting in my research. So I used the full text search function to 
see the return rate on words relevant to my research. So in this case, I looked up slave with an asterisk after it to look up instances of slave, slaves, and slavery, which are highlighted here. I know the writing's quite small, but you should be able to see by the yellow indications how many re results I got back, so this was quite promising. Um, so I returned 13 instances of slaves, 10 instances of slavery, um, and a couple of instances that weren't relevant, such as slavering and slaver. I knew the text result wasn't going to be perfect, but due to the volume of text I needed to process, my aim was to achieve a good enough low character error rate to use as, data, uh, as a usable data set. Although the text quality that I got back was significantly better than the original OCR that I'd looked at, the layout of the text posed a little bit of a challenge for transcribers, and we've obviously had a lot of discussion about layout difficulties earlier today, so um, hopefully we might have some answers in the future. Most pages in the Encyclopedia Britannica are laid out in two columns. This is a small section of one of the pages. Um, and as you read down the page, you read the left column first and then move and read down the right column. In some cases, the entire page was recognized as a text region, as you can see here with the green box around it, which meant that although the text was split into um, separate sentences for each column, unfortunately, this blurred together all of the text. So looking at individual entries is quite difficult because they end up merged across the page. Although this is something that could be fixed manually on a small scale, for the scale of data that I'm working with, it's quite difficult, so I was looking to other options. In some cases, there were instances of lines not being split across columns. So you can see in the top, the very top line of the entry um, has been recognized as one full sentence across the page, whereas it's actually two separate um, sentences. And this was the text region, was the whole page, sorry. <coughs> the whole page was recognized as a text region. The image below shows a similar issue, although the columns have been split into two. So this is something that the text was, that was being picked up in the layout analysis. To try and work around these issues, um, I tried training a baseline model and ran layout analysis on a sample of my text. This also returned mixed results, so um, I had high hopes for this, um, but I think due to the complete mismatch of some pages with um, quite tricky um, layouts, I just wasn't getting consistent results um, with anything that I tried. So if anyone has been working on text with columns and has any advice, I would really appreciate it. I've been in touch with the transcribers team and I've had some advice, um, which I've tried to implement, but if anyone else has had a similar issue, please grab me after the talk and I would love to have a chat. So what does this mean for my research? Um, my transcribers model has helped to generate a corpus of text with a reasonable low character error rate, um, therefore providing a good quantity of data that I will actually be able to use in my research. As I have such a large quantity, the ability to process additions at scale is crucial, and transcribers offers the, offers the means to do this and to create a usable data set. Initially, to narrow my scope, I'll be looking at the first and seventh editions, which indicated here. So you can see the page count. These are the numbered pages that include text. Uh, 2,659 pages, and then 17,047 pages. So as you can see, it is a very large quantity of text to work with. A massive advantage of digitally searching for keywords in the Encyclopedia Britannica is that you can get results that you don't expect. And this is something that I'm really interested in in my research. There are entries for slavery, sugar, Jamaica, I could go on with a huge list of them, where you might expect to see references of slavery, but it's where you get references that you don't expect that is really a point of interest to me. So this is just some very initial results, um, looking at some keywords from the first edition in volume one. So I looked up instances of the use of slaves, and you can see here a list of entries that they appeared in. I also made a note of the context that these appeared in, so what the entry was talking about, and found that of these, the majority of the entries were talking about slavery in the context of ancient Rome, rather than discussing contemporary slavery. I've also done some close reading analysis of the slavery entries across editions, and found that this is a recurring theme in the early editions, and it's only as 
the move towards abolition becomes stronger and think legislation gets passed through in Britain, that you see a more firm discussion of slavery, contemporary slavery and the sources. I'm still in very early stages of running my searches, so my apologies that I don't have a lot of nice visualizations like the last presentation, they were fantastic. Um, but it's something that I'm hoping to improve and expand on as I move through my research. So by identifying where my selected keywords appear in the editions and how frequently, I'm hoping to look at the networks created between the editions and across all of the entries. <clears throat> I'm also hoping to identify where new information is coming in into the editions as time progresses. With each new edition, there is usually an expansion um, of the general word count of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So I'm expecting to see an increased um, mention of certain keywords and hopefully uh, identify that in relation to slavery. I'm also interested whether certain keywords are repeated across editions or if you start to see a decline in the use of certain words. So I'm kind of throwing um, keywords out in the wind and seeing what comes back and then sort of trying to base, <laughs> explore further from there using um, distant reading and more of a close analysis as well. I'm also hoping to use topic modeling to more closely examine um, the entries relating to slavery and get an idea of the concepts that pop up in these entries quite frequently. I'm also using digital tools um, more widely, so I'm using R coding language. Um, so I'll be exporting my text files and running them through um, scripts of code um, to do my text mining and to create good visualizations. R has a lot of flexibility for this. The use of digital research methods and resources opens up a lot of new avenues of research and hopefully this will help reveal the extent of legacies of race and slavery in the Encyclopedia Britannica. I think there is so much information that is buried within these masses and masses of pages of text that it's quite difficult. It would be a life, more than a lifetime's work to go over and identify this all by hand. So very fortunate that I have my text created by Transcribus um, to go on and do more um, detailed analysis that just wouldn't be feasible manually. I'm hoping to dig a lot further into this and will be sharing my findings with the transcribers community as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation as well. Um, I think it was very insightful. Any questions? We have time for two, I guess. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> The good thing is, if somebody is using the, the microphone, also the people joining virtually can get hear up. everything. It's a red button. <laughs> it's on. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, Ash, because you had showed us kind of the dates for each edition, and there's quite a big gap, isn't there, from late 18th century to mid 19th century. Does the layout become more standardized for the later editions? And could that reduce the headache that you've got in terms of recognizing both columns? The short answer is no. Oh. <laughs> um, so basically you have very complex layouts where most pages are just representing two columns of text. Um, many other pages have the longer essays included. So you have columns, headings inserted into the middle of pages and then further columns. And it gets quite difficult trying to figure out exactly where you have to read, which is intuitive to humans, but more difficult. Um, to sort of instill into machine learning. Um, shouldn't be impossible, so um, I'd like to hear any further solutions, but it's, it doesn't become easier with the later editions, unfortunately, which is a shame. <laughs> right, we have a second question. Uh, have you ever tried out the block segmentation? This is a special method for printed texts, and it should be able to work with the two columns. No, I, I don't think I have, so that's fantastic. It's something that I've been <laughs> going around in circles with, and I've yeah, tried I, asking I, a few I, different I people. I fear it is a simple solution for your problem. Lovely, that's what I like to hear, as long so as it's, it's a simple solution, that's great. <laughs> it's in the layout analysis on top, where mm -hmm. you see uh, SITLAB Advanced, you open it, and then you can uh, select a printed block segmentation, and that's okay. made for such problems. Lovely, okay, I can, I'll try that, thank you very much. Perfect, then we are happy that we could help. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ash.
from the University of Edinburgh.